Cheers, guys. Epics 911. Welcome to the Wednesday, May 31st, 2017 edition of VR News. Some exciting stories tonight, especially the first one. This one got me excited. A new reference design laptop from NVIDIA using their Pascal GPUs. Now, similar to what they do with graphic cards, they also do with their laptops. So for graphic cards, they will build a reference design. And it's the core of what the vendors need to have in their own graphic card for that model, right? If it's a 1060, 1070, 1080, whatever. The Founders Edition were basically a fancy name for everybody's exact version of the, of the reference design. That's what it was, right? But typically, vendors will stray from that. They will add to it, usually not subtract because it's the core design, but they'll add. They might go with a better RAM quality, a third cooler if the reference had only two, etc. right? Profile dimensions may change, all of that kind of stuff. Well, NVIDIA does that for laptops as well. And their latest effort, they're calling Max Q. And on average, NVIDIA-based gaming laptops, which are essentially desktop replacements, right? They're not light, and they sure as hell aren't thin. So on average, usually about two inches, right, in height, 10 pounds, so that's 51 millimeters in height, 4.5 kilos. Compare that to the Max Q. 18 millimeters, so basically three quarters of an inch, and that's in height, 2.2 kilos or five pounds, so essentially half of what those 880 mobile-based gaming laptops from NVIDIA weighed and were sized at, so not bad. Plus, going to the Pascal, it's about 33 times the performance. They aren't gonna be cheap, we know that, right? But aesthetically, these things look damn good. And we've got word that Clevo, Asus, and MSI are all going to build their own takes of that reference design. So I expect the sleekness is going to be there. Certainly, the you know the Pascal power we know will be there. It's probably going to be a difference of some additional ports. One might have more USB, some additional display ports, etc. Right? Either way a hell of a good option for those of you who need to save space but want to do VR. Because remember, these Pascal mobile ones, they're only about 10, 15% performance away from their desktop counterparts. That's not bad. Next up, Road to VR partners with Eurogamer parent company, Gamer Network. Now, Road to VR is probably my second most used VR source right i think upload vr has them beat a little bit but in terms of quality they're fantastic now they were founded paul james and ben lang founded road to vr in 2011. what's interesting about that date is that was before the hype for vr really started to hit the mainstream they already had their ears to the ground so these guys have been around the block a few times they know vr and I think this is going to be a really good partnership for them for just enhancing their reach, right? They're going to be able to ride off of the gamer network, and it's huge. I've always loved, like Eurogamer is a magazine I've always enjoyed. Hell, I liked UK gaming magazines back in the 80s, Ace and Zap. I mean, they were fantastic. They're much bigger than the US ones. They're glossy, they're colorful, and absolutely filled to the brim with snark especially zap 64 it was fantastic so yeah i think this is going to be good according to them their own words this is ben lang one of the co-founders our partnership with gamer network is a huge win not just for us as a growing publication but also for our readers while media at large is trending in the opposite direction this move enhances our structural isolation of the advertising and editorial portions of our business, allowing us to continue to put readers first by providing crucial independent journalism that offers an honest reflection of the VR industry at large. So there you have it. I uh, expect good things to come of this for Road to VR and the Gamer Network. Very cool. 
Next up, a little disappointing, Striker VR launching pre-orders for their gun peripheral. The bad news? Holy Hannah, is it expensive. I'm going to cut right to the chase. $2,800 US. Yeah, you get an SDK with that and a bunch of other stuff. All that says to me is you're clearly not aiming at consumers. You're aiming at game companies, developers. The problem I have with that is 80 to probably 95% of VR game companies are indie. And that is a budget prohibitive price, 2800 and it doesn't come with really generous volume discounts either. The second you add a, you know, a second unit, pardon the pun, sure, you're maybe not 5,600, double that, but you're still 5,000 plus US dollars. So incrementally, that gets very expensive. And honestly, I don't see the industry going that way. Where I see them going is, we don't care what kind of gun you're using. Just make sure it has a trigger, four buttons that's it throw a tracker at the end of it or a touch or a vive done right that's going to leave the market open for all kinds of companies to create molds right plastic whatever cast guns rifles and you just put your tracker on it that's kind of where i see the industry going not the striker VR direction. So to me, that just seems a little high because you're still having to buy your development units, your Rift, your Vive on top of that. Gets pretty hefty price-wise. Next up, HTC promising seven millisecond latency for Intel's wireless Vive. And I gotta admit, I'm still confused with this. And if some of you responded to my video yesterday with an explanation on this. Maybe this came out while I was doing my drive. Haven't had a chance to read it yet, guys. I will. I'll go back. I'm also going to research the hell out of this. I spent most of the day doing blind installations and curtains and all that kind of stuff. The point is, where I'm confused is TPCast was clearly HTC, you know, being an equal partner, right? And it seems to work and at 60 gigahertz, which is everything Intel's solution is. So why Intel? And like I said, maybe we're gonna find out a little bit more at E3 in a couple of weeks in LA. I know that they are going to show a proof of concept version of this kit. Maybe it's as simple as HTC just looking to provide multiple options, right? Uh, they wanna be able to say, look, you can go for this, A, B, or C. You've got different price points for your wireless. But here's the benefits for each or the negatives. That could be. In fact, that's probably the only thing that I can see as a, as a why to explain it. But hopefully we find out. All right, next story. Microsoft revealing the Asus Mixed Reality headset as well as a redesign for the Dell. Now, we've seen the Dell before. It wasn't that amazing. Uh, you know what, compared to the Asus, it probably still isn't that amazing, but it's certainly a better design. Asus, however, I think they knocked it out of the park. I love this design, I love the black, both clearly borrowing from Sony's PlayStation VR school of comfort. You know, they've got that forehead rest there, clearly inspired by Sony's PlayStation VR, and that's okay, it works, right? It's freaking comfortable. What I love about the Asus though is on the front of the HMD, it's got that gem crystal diamond faceted look, right? You've got all those different kind of designs. It just looks awesome. And that black is perfect. The Dell side of things, very white, very clinical, right? Little too sterile for me. I get what they're going for. They're going for that, you know, Space Odyssey, modern white sterile look. Eh, just doesn't do it for me, right? I, I like the cameras, bottom left, bottom right, obviously for the inside out tracking, but not a huge fan of the aesthetics. Still, price wise, we're not sure. They didn't announce the price. What we do know though, is we know Acer's price and we know HP. Acer was 299 US, HP 329 US. So I imagine both uh, Dell and Asus, they're gonna come in somewhere there, probably not less, 
but likely in that range or a little bit more. And when I say a little bit more, 20 to 40, maybe 50 US at the highest outside of that. But um, yeah, so far, Asus has the best of the mixed reality HMDs uh, in terms of design. I think they, they nailed it. Now, the last thing on that I should mention though is Microsoft claims they have 20,000 apps available for the mixed reality headsets. Now, I could easily say, well, yeah, there's 1,000 Vive VR games. 940 are crap, right? You can make a statement like that. Maybe it's similar with the apps. I'd be interested to see what that's comprised of. And they certainly didn't go there, but we're going to find out soon enough. Next up, Samsung Gear VR beats Google Daydream View to the Chromecast support. And that one's a bit of a stunner. I thought for sure uh, Daydream was going to get Chromecast first. Doesn't look like it. Uh, it's going to arrive for Gear VR via the next... There's two updates, the next uh, Oculus Android app update, and of course, Android's own OS update. Both of those are going to bring that Chromecast support. So users are going to be able to mirror what they see, similar to what we already do with the PlayStation, the Vive, and the Rift, on a monitor. So you'll be able to record it, etc. So very cool. And the last news piece, a very impressive social VR demo. This thing just blew my mind because it absolutely nailed what I have in mind for multiplayer avatars in VR. They've nailed eye tracking and mouth facial expression tracking. The guys behind this, it's uh, Face and Communication Entertainment. Uh, it's a project from a Kloppel company called 360CH. And they built a little social VR demo. They collaborated with a bunch of companies that we know that do different tracking things. For example, Fove, that's the F-O-V-E HMD that does the eye tracking. FaceRig, uh, they do 3D model rendering tech. And then binary VR, which is the facial expression tracking. So they brought all this together. And man, if I've got the video playing right now for you guys, you'll see how seamless it is and how damn accurate it is. And no one can Valley, as long as you're using, you know, cartoon avatars and hell, even humans, it would be fantastic. I can picture playing Elite Dangerous, right? Where you've got your co-pilots and stuff with you, Star Citizen, really any game in VR that's multiplayer or co-op based, having that type of facial and eye tracking, wow, that is going to be freaking cool because it's one thing to hear each other, right? You're doing an MMO, you hear each other, but to have that sync up with an avatar delivering those lines, it just, it's going to kick it into that next level of immersion. Absolutely. All right, guys, that is it for Wednesday's news. Hopefully, you guys are having a good week so far. We are at hump day officially. A couple more days and weekend again. Guys, cheers. <laughs>